ponder the dilemmas of modern capitalism. This program will be co-sponsored by the Pacific Northwest Economic Conference and will feature renowned economist Alice Rivlin, who is a senior fellow of the Brookings Institution. We'll meet at the Hilton Hotel at our regular time with the program beginning at 12.15. The Government and Public Safety Issues Committee will meet on Wednesday, May the 22nd, from 5.30 until 7 at Kells. Colonel Bill Hiller, retired, who is a veteran of the Army Special Forces with a specialty in counter-terrorism and psychological warfare, will speak on the topic of domestic terrorism. Club members, you should now be in the habit of making your luncheon reservations online and receiving your weekly bulletin by, by email. If not, leave your email address with staff member as you leave or call the club office and we'll get it fixed. Remember, you can get past presentations on our website and you can purchase videotapes for $20 and audio tapes for $10. Call Suzanne at the club for more details of that. Our board host, seated at my far right, is Jane Cease. This may be the only time you ever see her at the far right of anything, but here she is. <laughs> She's a member of the Board of Governors and first Vice President of the club. She will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speaker. Following Jane's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question briefly and as clearly as you can. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Portland General Electric, from CH2M Hill, and from Providence Health Systems, and we're most grateful for their support. Fred Hansen was Deputy Chief Administrator at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C., before taking the mantle of TriMet General Manager three and a half years ago. Leaving responsibility for 18,000 employees and an annual budget of $7.8 billion for a post at the head of Portland's transit agency must have looked to his colleagues like a relaxing return to his Oregon roots. It's been nothing of the sort. Mr. Hansen arrived just after light rail had received its second humiliating defeat at the polls with measure 2674 in the fall of 1998. He addressed the club a few months later, focusing on the critical role that transit plays in maintaining the region's livability. Since then, streetcar service has been added, light rail service to the airport has been opened, and construction on of what will be the Yellow Line, north to Expo Center, is well in hand. To date, more than $2.9 billion worth of development has occurred within walking distance of the 54 MAX stations, and integrated bus services have helped to focus investment elsewhere along transit corridors. Somehow, with each accomplishment, new and different challenges seem to appear. Growth in transit ridership in the Portland metro area is among the strongest in the country, yet it's not keeping pace with growth, and federal funding is becoming scarcer. New strategies must be devised to maintain our edge as a national model. So for an update on the role of transit in our region and of the seemingly intractable, intractable problems that beset the continued success, please welcome the General Manager of TriMet, Fred Hansen. Well, thank you, Patty, for that kind introduction. I am very pleased uh, to be here at City Club once again. It is, oops, I can get this turned a little bit here. It's always a great pleasure to see me, so many familiar faces and recognize what a tremendous job you have all done to promote the civic quality of life of this very special place we call home. I'd like to pay particular attention to a guest in the audience somebody who was my mentor, is my mentor, serves as a second father to me, and is a very, very special friend. Former member of Congress from Oregon's fifth con or fourth congressional district, as well as director of the Peace Corps, the Honorable John Dellenbach. without bow tie, but my wife Joyce has a bow tie on to commemorate. <laughs> this afternoon, I'd like to be at cover four areas. First, some of the really remarkable successes we've had in this region in terms of providing mobility 
to our citizens. Next, I would like to share with you the exciting effort we have underway to improve service and take a giant step into the 21st century to continue to make our transportation system the envy of the United States. Then I'll share with you how in these tough economic times we are doing more with less by engaging our frontline workers to make our operations at TriMet as efficient as possible. Lastly, I want to focus on the tremendously exciting possibilities in our future and how we are going to achieve our vision for mobility in the region. All of what I share with you today have been accomplished with resources that are not guaranteed for the future. So while I am proud of what has been done, I am concerned that we have expectations that, without increased resources, we won't fulfill. First, let me begin with a remarkable story about our successes. One obviously very important element of that success has been Westside Max that opened three and a half years ago. Just in, forms, in terms of pure ridership, if we project out the expectations we made when we were first building Westside Max, we'd have to look all the way out to 2010 to be able to see the kind of ridership numbers we're experiencing today. In terms of attracting new people to Westside Max, our research shows that one half of the people riding Westside Max did not take transit before. Airport Max opened September 10th, just one day before the terrorist attacks. Our new line was a part of the of a very important providing of transportation for the hundreds of people that were stranded at the airport during that terrible time. In the time since September 11th, our ridership has been ahead of projections in spite of a sharp decline in air travel. And of course, Portland Streetcar, which opened in July 20th of last year, thank you, Charlie, has a, been a remarkable success as well. And while rail projects get a lot of attention, we shouldn't overlook the remarkable story of our bus system as well. Over the past three years, we greatly expanded what we call our premium service, that is, buses that come every 15 minutes, all day, during the evening, on weekdays, on Saturdays, and on Sundays. Three years ago, we had four lines that were providing that quality service. Today, we have 14 lines re, uh, which result in double-digit ridership growth. And as a result, those 14 lines carry about 43% of all our riders. In fact, TriMet's ridership is growing twice as fast as population growth and about 25% faster than car use. Less than a handful of other major metropolitan areas in this country can make that claim. Along with Max and buses, we provide critical services to the frail, the elderly, and the disabled. Our lift service provides 3,000 rides every day to people who would not be able to get from where they are to where they want to be if it were not for this service. And although this meets a federal mandate under the Americans with Disabilities Act, we believe that it is a fundamental obligation of us at TriMet to ensure that we meet the mobility needs of all of our citizens. Who are all these, these citizens that ride TriMet? Our riders look very much like the whole of the community. 83% of our riders are what we call choice riders. That is, they have a vehicle, access to a vehicle, or they own a vehicle, but choose to be able to make use of our system. And from the demographic standpoint, they are a cross-section of our community as well. TriMet service isn't just about people who do not have other forms of transportation. It is for all of us. In fact, if you in this room are a reflection of the people who live in our region, 80% of you will take TriMet at least once this year, making connections to all parts of the region. In many ways, TriMet is the poster child in this nation for everything that is being done right within transit, and we are very proud of that reputation. It is interesting when we ask our riders when they're going to an event, such as a Blazers game, well, next year anyway. That is, when they are going to such an event, 
um, if they are driving to the Rose Quarter, um, they believe that the event begins for them when they have parked their car and they're on their way in to the arena. However, when they take TriMet, the event begins for them the minute they step on that TriMet bus or TriMet Max train. TriMet is a part of the adventure. They have a chance to interact with their families or friends without worrying about traffic or where to find a parking space. Our transit system provides much more than just mobility. Our transit system gives people choices about how they go to special events, how they go shopping, how they go to Saturday market, to the Lloyd Center, the zoo, or a concert. In fact, we carry substantial numbers of riders on weekends when most other transit systems in this country are barely operating. With Saturday ridership on max, we are seeing numbers almost equal to what we see during the weekday. And Sunday ridership on both bus and max is our fastest day of the week in terms of growth. Our transit system is also extremely important to our air quality. We help make the air cl much cleaner to breathe. In fact, if you look around our region, because people take TriMet rather than drive, we eliminate the same amount of smog-forming air pollution as put out by nine Intel plants or 19 Tektronic plants. That is about 4.2 pounds, tons, per, pardon me, 4.2 uh, tons per day. What's more important, we help to keep the region meeting national ambient air quality standards, something I have spent numerous years of my professional career working on. This is first and foremost a critical need for our health, particularly children, the elderly, and anyone with respiratory problems. But it is also critical to our economic well-being. The Portland metro region is on the margin, barely in compliance with the federal health standards. We could easily slip into non-compliance with the Clean Air Act, with, and the single largest contributor to this is the automobile. But federal law says that if we do violate those federal health standards, we look not at the auto, the cause, but at industry to fix the problem. If we are violating standards, any new business or major expansion of an existing business must install most, the most effective control technology without regard to cost. And those same businesses must also buy what are called offsets, that is, at least one pound of pollution must be found and reduced for every new pound the business will emit. These two requirements would cost Portland area businesses at least $10 million. And for, furthermore, they would prove to be the, a major obstacle to a healthy economy. In many ways, whether it is the lead-in footage on a local newscast or a description of this region in Sunset Magazine or other travel magazines, we see our transit system featured. Fairless Square, the deepest train platform in North America, in fact, in the second in the world only to Moscow at the zoo, the opening of the streetcar last July, or the first train to the plane on the west coast with Airport Max. Our transit system is a part of the signature of the Portland region, and one of which we are very proud. We at TriMet are working very hard to improve that system. Not long, too long ago, we celebrated the 50% completion point of the Interstate Max. Here is a project that takes Max from the Rose Quarter to Expo, within sight of Vancouver. And Interstate Max provides essential services to an area that has some of the highest transit usage in our region. It will also allow our north and northeastern neighborhoods an opportunity to redevelop in a way that meets their vision. We've also made sure that our construction projects are meeting the very high standards of this region. First and foremost, we are ensuring that we are able to deliver each and every one of our projects on time and on budget. The Interstate Max project is running not only on time and on budget, but ahead of schedule and a bit below budget. When we launched the Interstate Max project three years ago, I made a commitment that the people in the communities through which the line was going to go would benefit from that project, both in forms of direct employment 
as well as by contracting with businesses from the area. Early on, I was visited by James Posey and Bernie Foster, who wanted to talk about that commitment. And uh, for those of you who know James, who uh, owns Workhorse Construct, uh, con pardon me, Workhorse Construction, a trucking firm, um, you know that he uh, is a bit of a doubting Thomas. Um, he looked at me and said, uh, um, I don't know if you're really going to be able to deliver that because I only believe in one theory, and uh, that's the Kaplunk theory. And I said, James, what do you mean by the Kaplunk theory? And he said, when I hear dirt go Kaplunk in my truck bed, I'll know it's real. <laughs> so about four months later, I got a phone call, and it was James Posey on the line, uh, and only with slight literary license, I picked up the phone, and I said, hi, James, how are you? And I heard only one word, kaplunk. <laughs> James, thank you for being here today. It's an honor to have you a part of the Interstate Max project. <laughs> In this and other settings, we have ensured that local homegrown businesses, including disadvantaged business enterprises, are able to work on the project. We have done this by breaking down large contracts into bite-sized portions, allowing beginning businesses to win contracts. And we've, we have built capacity in these businesses so that in the future they will be able to compete successful, successfully for other contracts once work is completed on Interstate Max. We have a remarkable story to tell. Just under 25% of the workforce in both the prime contractor and the major subcontractors on Interstate Max have been minorities. As a result, we have been able to achieve a level of involvement with our North and Northeast community that could not have been done otherwise. And we have done all these things while getting the highest quality of work at the best prices. I mentioned earlier how honored I was to have John Dellenbach here, my mentor. I think it's also a responsibility of TriMet to mentor businesses and individuals within our community. I would like to tell you a story about one of those businesses we have mentored. Marcella Ella Cantar was born in Mexico. Because her family was poor, she was moved from one family member to another uh, as a uh, uh, to ensure that she would have enough to be able to be fed among all those family members. When her parents decided to leave Mexico in search of a better life, Marcella stayed behind until they could raise the money to send for her. At age 17, Marcella came to America. She did not speak English, but Marcella had determination and a dream. She is now a design engineer and is a subcontractor for Parsons Brinkerhoff, TriMet's engineering consultant, Marcella's company will make a, a lasting impression forever on Interstate Max. Marcella, thank you also for being here with us. We are doing many things to improve our transit system. We are providing more and more real-time bus arrival information with our transit tracker. It displays not just the scheduled time of the arrival for the bus or the train, but it provides the actual time of that uh, arrival, counting down 14, 13, 12 minutes away. What real-time information provides is an opportunity for people to relax, read a newspaper or book, go get a cup of coffee, stop at the ATM machine while they wait. It provides real time and a real benefit to the people who are using our transit system. And now for select lines, you can pull this information up on your home or office computer and know just when you have to get out to that bus stop to not miss your bus. We're also experimenting, as many of you have read, with a new type of bus propulsion system, the so-called hybrid bus. We will have them in, uh, two of them in operation in the next week or so. It is a significantly cleaner, quieter, and smarter bus, operating much along the lines of the Honda Insight or to Toyota Prius cars. It is significantly cleaner, quieter, and smarter. 
it is up to 70, per, 70 plus percent cleaner than a normal bus. It runs on a pickup size diesel engine and electric batteries. It also saves substantially on diesel fuel, which saves not only money, but by saving on fuel, we're able to address another important environmental issue, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 50%. This is a remarkable achievement as we address global climate change. The hybrid bus is parked just outside on Southwest Broadway for you to take a look at on your way out of today's event. We are also finding ways for citizens to utilize their transit system in even easier fashion. We removed restrictions to make it easier for bike riders to use transit. We have tried to make sure that our bus stops are safe and provide a dry place to stand. We're putting out more and more bus shelters and we're improving pedestrian access and safe street crossings by working closely with other governments throughout our region. But if we're to meet our future demand, we have a long way to go. Before we look at other resources of uh, other sources, pardon me, of revenue to make investments in our transit system, I want to tell you about a major effort I launched two years ago aimed at improving our product uh, productivity at TriMet. We did this by engaging our frontline workers, those who are doing, a work, uh, doing the work day in and day out. As you probably know, a transit system doesn't work nine to five, five days a week. It has to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even when we're not providing service on the street, we need to have our mechanics and our cleaners service our buses and trains so they'll be ready to pull out the next morning. We have found ways to increase productivity and as a result, we have saved about $10 million on an annualized basis. We realized these savings without needing to cut back on any service that was on the street. But instead, we found more productive ways to deliver that service. We also looked to the private sector for productivity models to be emulated. For example, we visited Boeing, who is known nationally and as one of the best inventory managers to learn about their parts utilization forecasting system. In applying similar forecasting techniques to our, uh, to our operation, TriMet has already saved an estimated half million dollars in our rail and bus inventory carrying costs. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize three of our frontline workers from TriMet who are here today and who have made a real difference in this productivity effort. They are Bob Culpepper from Rail Maintenance, Ron, Ron Doctor from Field Operations, and Bill Wegesund from Bus Maintenance. All in all, these productivity improvement uh, program successes are something for which everyone at TriMet is to be complimented and in which we take great pride. Let me turn lastly this afternoon to our future. I think the future is very bright, but we have much more to do. In peak hours, our frequent buses are full. Our park and ride lots, most popular ones, fill by 7 or 7.15 in the morning. Our max, max trains are full. We need to provide more service. We need more service to growing industrial areas. We need new service to growing cities and town centers in our region. We are taking steps today to accomplish at least some of these goals. First, a major effort is currently underway to evaluate how to substantially expand transit service into the fast-growing Clackamas County areas. This study began shortly after the loss of the bond measure in 1998 for the South-North Light Rail alignment. And although the bond measure failed, the citizens from these communities told us their preferred transit option was light rail as long as they could design how it worked in their neighborhoods. We are now exploring light rail down McLaughlin to Milwaukee, as well as light rail along I-205 from Clackamas Town Center to Gateway. Citizens and officials in Clackamas County know how important light rail is to move people and spur development and redevelopment that is more transit oriented. But very real challenges remain about how we raise the necessary 40% match required by the Federal Transit Administration so they will cover the remaining costs 
from the U.S. Treasury. We have also have a very exciting project in the Washington County commuter rail. This effort has been led by Washington County and spearheaded by Tom Bryan, the county chair, to make use of an existing freight rail alignment from Tualatin or Wilsonville, ultimately connecting into the MAX alignment at Beaverton Transit Center. Commuter rails, a different type of service that, is, that uses full-size rail cars, something that many other regions of the country have found to be a very good way to move commuters. It is cost-effective because it relies upon an existing railway alignment and track. That project um, is still in the final stages of design and should be up and operating by 2005. But if we hope to expand commuter rail to other parts of our region, we run into the same problems as we have in Clackamas County, and that is the need for that 40% 40, 40 local match. Even as we look at these projects that are in the pipeline, we realize that there are many parts of the region where we don't go. We need ex to extend Interstate Max from Expo to downtown Vancouver. We need light rail on Barber Boulevard to Tigard. We need light rail out Foster and Powell through the Lentz neighborhood. And we also need light rail to go over the Columbia River into East Clark County near I-205 and loop from there to downtown Vancouver. All these things we must do if we have to have the essential skeleton of a fixed route, that is, light rail system, to serve our community. And this is just the skeleton. We need to put flesh on that skeleton by overlaying it with a substantial improvement in the bus system not just those 14 lines of premium service I mentioned earlier, but a system which offers premium service to all parts of our region. I've outlined an ambitious plan for our future public transportation goals. Let me now give you my five-year action plan. First, within the next five years, we must have begun construction on light rail to serve Clackamas County. Within five years, we need to have Washington County commuter rail up and operating. Within five years, we need to have a firm plan in place and actions underway to extend light rail to Vancouver. In five years, we need to have 65% of our riders who use buses to be on that premium high frequency lines and to have those lines serve all parts of our region, connecting cities and town centers one with another. Within the next five years, we need to have 100 electric hybrid buses delivering service in a more environmentally friendly manner. Within five years, we need to start work on a streetcar extension along the Willamette Shore trolley alignment through the North Mac Macadam area to Lake Oswego. In fact, when we do this, we can deliver passengers from downtown Lake Oswego to downtown Portland in less than 20 minutes. Lastly, within five years, we need to provide more and more technology to our riders so they can make use of our system in as efficient fashion as possible. To have handheld devices that will tell them in real time when to expect a bus or a max train, how to make connections, how to get from where they are to where they want to be in the most convenient and straightforward manner. Some of the vision that I have just outlined, and certainly the expectations of the 2040 plan that calls for smart transportation investments to maintain our livability, require that we make these major investments, some of these major investments today. Unfortunately, there are invest these are investments that we do not have the resources to make. The demand for our services is growing at a much higher rate than our ability to provide that service. With our current financial resources, we are able to grow our transit system by about 1.5% per year. To meet the demand for transit service and ensure our future livability, however, those goals that I have outlined, we need to grow the system at about 4.5%, about three times faster than current resources allow. To grow the system that we all want, I need, to, I need the help and support of each one of you in this room today. I need the help of community leaders like our board president, George Pasador, who has been a tireless champion of our investments in transit. I need the help of the downtown business community to work with us to find a way to revitalize the transit mall, 
without sacrificing the transit service we now have. I need the help of government leaders to be our partners in making sure that transit receives its fair share of available transportation dollars. I need the help of local governments and the Oregon Department of Transportation to work with us to improve sidewalk access, providing safe passage for our riders between their homes and transit centers and bus stops. I need the help of our riders to make sure we design a system that best meets their needs. Together, we can build the future rail system that serves all corners of our region and Clark County. Together, we can ensure that our Elderly and disabled citizens have transportation options so they can fully participate in our society. Together we can expand transit options in local areas and town centers and we need to be able to do that to connect our whole region. We can improve our bus service, making it frequent and reliable. In short, together we can ensure that our city and our region continue to merit its national reputation for quality of life. Together, we can maintain what we have today, the most livable community in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, I'm Jane Cease, and I'm supposed to ask the first question here for Fred Hansen. Um, I just want to say I had a really nice ride downtown on a very nice bus line that serves my area um, with a great bus driver. Um, and, but I guess, I guess my question really deals with um, the adequacy of the revenue mix uh, that our transit service exists on, which is, which is very complex with federal and state and local and fare box and employer payroll tax and business community, uh, business community partnerships. And um, I, I guess my question is, do you see that mix continuing and being adequate? Um, I don't think we're going to ever get uh, voters to change the Constitution to get transit out of the uh, existing highway fund. I'd be pessimistic about that. but. Um, sort of tell us where you think we're going to need to go uh, in order to fund the services that we very, very much need to have a quality um, area to live in. Thank you, Jane. Uh, and I'm glad that we were able to provide you good service here today. Uh, the, uh, Jane has every once in a while called me up when she doesn't think that service is quite so good. So I'm glad we uh, delivered today. There are two parts of funding transit that are critical. One is to be able to build the projects that are there, whether it's a light rail station, a light rail alignment, whether it is uh, bus uh, uh, stops and platforms, uh, to be able to buy the buses, light rail vehicles, and so on. The capital side of that equation. Then the second uh, key part is the operation. That is, the ongoing cost of being able to operate uh, those systems. Um, what I think is important is, in the, uh, if you think about the road side of the equation, on that second element, that is the operational side, we essentially um, provide the roads through public funding, but expect that the individual will in fact pay for the operation, that is their own vehicle, um, their uh, insurance, uh, all other things. However, in public transportation, those costs are borne um, by we, the public. The uh, fare box in this nation pays for about 25% of operating costs of transit systems. We do a little bit better than the national average by paying 27% out of the fare box. But 75% or thereabouts must come from other sources. Now, to the sources of revenue. On capital projects, the federal government provides substantial federal match, and as I outline, they are generally now requiring that the local areas come up with 40% of that match and that the federal government will pay 60%. We are in danger of losing that 60% to federal dollars if we do not find ways to be able to appropriately match those. We have done that in the past by utilizing bond uh, revenue, property tax uh, revenue uh, supporting general obligation bonds. 
We have done it through um, lottery dollars assisting. However, most recently on the Interstate Max project, we've done it by cobbling together local uh, uh, resources from the City of Portland, Portland Development Commission, TriMet, and others to be able to accomplish those ends. We are going to have to find alternatives to that capital side of that project. And lastly, as we build those lines to be able to operate, as I said, we're able to increase our service at about 1.5% per year. But that is about one-third of what we need to be able to meet the vision we have all outlined, I think, and we want to be able to have for long-term livability. How we do that, I think, is a question that has yet to be answered. I believe first we must, in fact, um, I've outlined a very aggressive vision for where we ought to go. That needs to be the vision of all of us, and that needs to have broader discussion. Number two is, as I've outlined in our productivity improvement program, this community needs to understand how much we have, in fact, ensured that TriMet is operating in the most cost-effective, efficient, productive fashion possible before we talk about more revenue. I think we can do that, but I think those are the discussions that need to occur first. While others are getting to the microphone, I have a question from the floor. John Charles of the Cascade Policy Institute and other Max critics have argued that, uh, that expansion of Max was not feasible because Steel Bridge could only carry four trains an hour in each direction, and that's how many it was carrying at the time. Now, with the opening of Airport Max, the frequency of trains on that bridge has doubled without any difficulties that I can see. Have you received any apology or any other acknowledgments of this <laughs> accomplishment? <laughs> And can, <laughs> and can you offer an engineering estimate of the maximum frequency of trains that the bridge could handle as currently designed? The answer to the first question is no. <laughs> um, I think that uh, citizens have, in fact, uh, um, voted with their seats uh, rather than their feet, and that is when we are seeing ridership on Max, that even our critics thought our original projections were way too optimistic but that we see we are realizing today that which we would have expected to have in 2010. I think it's a, a, a foregone conclusion that the popularity of our system uh, speaks for itself. In terms of the uh, capacity, very frankly, the steel bridge is not the, uh, the most constraining elements of it. It is on uh, Yamhill and Morrison, um, and we can run trains about every two minutes um, on, those, uh, on those streets without uh, disrupting uh, traffic uh, and being able to achieve our, uh, our goals. So we've uh, got a lot of ability to yet expand. Uh, Fred, I'm Pete Heuser. I'm a City Club member. Okay. Have you given any thought to having a fareless system? You say the fares now account for 25, 27 percent of your, of your revenue. Um, Fairless system, presumably you'd get a lot more ridership, uh, you could uh, build a better system, more people would take it, we'd all benefit from less traffic, uh, cleaner air. Um, or ha has there been a system in the world where there has been a fairless mass transit system that has been successful? Um, first, um, we ought to talk just a moment about uh, the issue of, uh, in terms of, of fairless. From my standpoint, um, and when we ask our riders, um, how important uh, is the price of that ticket um, and how critical is it, uh, um, whether it is uh, at the price it is, where do they want to see those dollars go? The answer is they ask first to have more service, they ask second to be able to have lines go more places, and they ask for it to be serving for more hours. In fourth place has been the issue of cost. They generally think it is a good value. The Oregonian has editorialized that the cost of going fareless would be somewhere around $100 million. Whether that number is exactly right or not, let me assure you that our riders, and certainly my view is, that if that $100 million is available, it ought to go into expanding our service dramatically. It ought not to go into deleting that fare. I'm Carter Kennedy, City Club member. When um, Clark County voted down the light rail a few years ago, it was said that they didn't object to the light rail as much as the uh, transit planners uh, high-handed dictating of where they thought. Uh, it was said that they didn't listen to the people of the area. And that was said also about uh, Westside light rail in some cases. 
I'm wondering if TriMet has has changed, or is that is that perception wrong? And uh, if so, has TriMet, if not, has TriMet improved its public relation and its uh, ability and willingness to work, re uh, not just appear to work, but really work with neighborhoods and uh, and citizens to on the routing and and other parts of the service. I think one of the most remarkable stories is what we have seen happen in Milwaukee. Milwaukee, uh, during the debate on the South-North uh, light rail in 1998, um, had uh, numerous, uh, very vociferous opponents of light rail. Um, and what we are now seeing, when we have worked with the members of that community, uh, Metro, us, the city council, the mayor uh, in Milwaukee, that some of those strongest opponents have now become proponents of light rail in Milwaukee when they got to design that alignment in their community. I think we are seeing over the last even three and a half years that I've been at TriMet a fundamental shift in how people are perceiving light rail and transit in general. They are seeing its value because they know their roads and their streets cannot take the traffic that is expected to be able to come their way. They know their citizens are demanding to have choices about how they go from uh, home to work or to the, go the store or wherever it might be. And I think we're seeing that same shift occur within Clark County and Vancouver. Mayor Royce Pollard, County Commissioner Craig Pridemore, um, and the efforts underway on the I-5 Trade Corridor Partnership on which I serve are beginning to see, I think, changes. As a result, I believe fundamentally that if we are able to work closely with neighborhoods, we can make mass transit, we can make the, whether it's light rail or bus stops, be a neighborhood friendly um, system rather than something that is opposed, that is the proof of the pudding is in what I think happened in Milwaukee, uh, and I'm very proud of that. Ray Polani, a City Club member. And needless to say, a supporter of transit. <laughs> needless to say. Uh, first of all, I think I would like to respond to that question about the free transit system. My wife and I were fortunate enough in 1978 to visit Boston, Moscow, and Leningrad at the peak of the Soviet Union. The transit was not free. So if it wasn't free there in a socialist state, it certainly shouldn't be free here. Uh, now, to the question of the future. Five years, you mentioned the aggressive expansion program. And we are in agreement with everything you said. But there is one piece, one critical piece missing. In five years, you've got to start seriously thinking about how you're going to put transit underground in the center of the city and we mean including the Willamette River. Obviously, you need the capacity to carry a lot more people, and you need the speed to go through the city, which is the crossroads of north, south, east, west. So that should be thought. That is a capital project, but it's also an operating project, as you mentioned before, and you need money for both. I think time has come to seriously look at the gas tax. The reason is that the gas tax is the lowest of the world, not only in Oregon, but in the country. And I think we should, it's time we should look at what Europe, all of Europe is doing. The gas tax is substantially higher, five times as high, and the money is used for everything, including transit. How about TriMet at the next legislative session beginning to lobby for an increase in the gas tax and for the flexibility to use the gas tax for both capital and operating. How about it? I was wondering where that question was. First, I have to uh, compliment uh, Ray. Uh, he came and visited me uh, not too long ago, and he came in a very dapper, uh, double-breasted suit uh, that he uh, indicated that he actually wore uh, to his wedding 50, some 50 years ago. I think all of us would like to be able to fit into the clothes we wore 50 years ago. 
Um, Ray, I think that the um, issues uh, around, first, uh, your uh, question about do we go underground or not, are issues that, uh, in, uh, that are possible that we are going to need to wrestle with. Very frankly, as I look at the uh, cross-traffic uh, um, and other uh, um, areas where we will have the concentration of, uh, of rail or bus activities, um, I do not see that in the next uh, five or ten years. I think we can manage uh, that. Uh, most other transit systems in this country do not expect uh, what is referred to a one-seat ride, that is, that you get on and never transfer, but rather if you have convenient transfer points that are very short uh, between uh, um, uh, vehicles, um, well covered and protected areas, the ability to have transfers are there and I think it can be managed. Um, whether in the long run we ought to do that, I think that will be a part of the uh, environmental impact statements that are going to be looked at and in terms of the number of the projects. Your specific question relative to whether or not the the uh, state constitution should be amended uh, um, to uh, allow for non-highway uses. Um, that's been talked about for uh, many a year. Uh, um, I have not seen any uh, overwhelming level of support. In fact, I've seen uh, um, not very much support out there for it. And very candidly, when you look at the fact that increasing gas mileage, other than some of our SUVs, combined with the fact of uh, alternative fuel vehicles coming online, I'm not sure one wants to look at the gas tax as a long-term um, resource. In fact, we're seeing more and more on the highway side that the effort to be able to look at a broader way of being able to think about financing even our road system that clearly is available to utilize that gas tax, I think has more promise. Thank you. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. Hi, Fred. Hi, B.J. Um, I'm one of your choice riders. I have a car. It'll be 11 years old next month, and it's almost up to 30,000 miles. <laughs> and if, <laughs> thank you, if TriMet ever goes as far as Ashland, I might give up the car. Um, my question is, I love the new streetcar. Uh, what has been its impact on the number 15 and 17 lines that also go to Northwest Portland, and also what has been the impact of Airport Max on the number 12 line? Um, thanks, BJ. Um, I, I, your comment about uh, the uh, low mileage, I've coined a new phrase for my vehicle, uh, my private car. Um, no longer is it MPG, that is miles per gallon. I use um, MBF, that is months between fill-ups. Uh, <laughs> Um, the uh, first, uh, in terms of the 17 and 15, which are two of our bus lines that serve Northwest Portland, um, we saw in the beginning months a slight drop off, nowhere near the number that we're actually getting on streetcar. Um, we saw in terms of the uh, the ridership, and even that has come back a little bit as the last numbers I looked at in terms of the 15 and 17. So what the streetcar has really done is expand number of people who are using transit rather than necessarily shrinking back and merely switching one from another. Not unlike what we saw on West Side Max when West Side Max went in place, about half of the people who were using it were new to transit. Um, Back to the, your second issue was, pardon me. My second issue was uh, uh, the number 12 line number 12, yes. and Airport Max. Um, we ended up uh, with Airport Max uh, reconfiguring the number 12. It no longer goes to the airport. Um, it goes on all the way out to, uh, to Gresham and provides very quality service out Sandy. Uh, and we think that that uh, has, in fact, we've seen tremendous increases on that relative to the number of people that were taking the bus to the airport versus the number taking the max, I'm not going to get the, quite the right multiplier, but it is dramatically greater numbers utilizing um, airport max. And it is used in all sorts of ways. I ride it all the time, and I find that people um, are using it to go out and meet friends or family at the airport and then come back in, hop off at a uh, park and ride lot. Uh, um, I was just at a chamber breakfast the other morning, and they were, uh, I was sitting next to an individual who said, you know, I told my employees, I bet you nobody here would take Airport Max uh, ever. Uh, you know, why would you do it? it? You know, you can do things, uh, it's a lot more convenient to drive. And he said, you know, I got, somebody told me uh, of my staff that they really uh, liked it, and so I tried it. You know, and I got to get work done on the way out there. It was more productive. I just loved it. So I think that's what we're seeing happening more and more, and the numbers support it. Thanks, BJ. 
Chris Smith, club member, and uh, full disclosure, member of the Portland Streetcar Citizens Advisory Committee. And BJ set up my question very nicely. You talked about expansion of streetcar to Lake Oswego almost in a kind of interurban capacity. Uh, and then you talked about buses filling out the flesh of the light rail system. Is there a role for streetcar to help fill out the flesh uh, of the light rail system and provide some perhaps uh, land use uh, incentives that buses don't provide in the same way? Um, I think that the, the streetcar, and again, I think uh, all of us owe a great a, a deal of uh, gratitude to a lot of people on this, but certainly City Commissioner Charlie Hales has just been uh, tremendous uh, in this effort. Uh, um, what I see uh, that is uh, critical is that the streetcar is not in competition with light rail. It serves a very different type of setting. It is a very urban uh, uh, kind of setting. It works very well. Um, high speeds are not one of its strong suits, as is uh, um, light rail. So consequently, um, what I see is that it will be a very real complement. For me, on the, um, if one talks about the Lake Oswego alignment, you're probably talking somewhere in a range of 35 to 40 miles per hour maximum that you would uh, want to go along that alignment, and that works perfectly for streetcar. That's the kind of thing that it would come in to River Place, connect up with the rest of streetcar. I think the opportunities to expand streetcar have a lot of opportunities within our community, not just the downtown core area, but something very frankly that might be used in circulators in some of our town centers or other places in the long run. Ultimately, that is a part of what is our fixed guideway system. And I think that when you see something that is as permanent as streetcar or light rail, we see that people are willing to make investments around that in a way that a bus stop just doesn't quite encourage, though I think we can do more with our bus stops as well. Ruth Curry, City Club member. Uh, like Jane, I too uh, partook of TriMet coming down. Thank you. And uh, I want to say that I was very skeptical about going out to the airport um, um, to, for myself. Uh, but I did it in the last month, and uh, it was terrific. Uh, Ro was coming back from D.C., I arrived in the afternoon, sitting near a woman who was coming in for a co convention from San Francisco, and she was absolutely delighted and impressed with, with the whole thing of coming in, and we had a chance to tell her how to get to the hotel, and so on and so forth. Now my question. <laughs> um, I live, I moved from my house because uh, I, uh, TriMet uh, took away my bus some 10 years or so before, and I'd, as I got older, I didn't think that I wanted to get that much older and have to walk uh, over a little over a mile um, to catch a bus on a, without sidewalks, one way each way. Um, so I did move. I now have access to two buses within two blocks. But coming home, coming home on the train, I can catch a 35 and not have to wait too long. Luckily, the timing is right. But the other times, uh, the bus, I, if I go downtown in the evening, I, ha I have to take the car because I'm not willing. There isn't an opportunity to synchronize when the symphony ends and so on and so forth. Um, is there any chance, I mean, they run once an hour um, on 35 and 40. Is there any chance for a more frequent? Or is, is there anything about having a, a, a smaller um, bus van for the late that would substitute? Because there might not be a lot of drivers. Um, Several elements to your question. First, um, as I said in, in my more formal comments, um, premium service, that is a service that comes every 15 minutes during rush hour, during the day, in the evenings, on Saturdays and Sundays, we see when we put that type of service out that we get unbelievable responses in ridership. The number 33 McLaughlin um, that goes down, not, uh, the e not the most pedestrian friendly of, uh, of roads, saw on Sundays alone, when we put that service out two and a half years ago, saw a 144% increase on Sunday ridership, on Saturday about 92%, and on weekdays about 44%. Those are remarkable numbers and tells us that when people have quality service, they use it. 
What has to happen is, though, that service is expensive if we don't have the ridership on it. And so, what, uh, as I've said, and as we've expanded over the last three and a half years from four lines that had that kind of premium service to 14 lines today, I want to see that go up dramatically in the next uh, number of years. Um, but whether it'll be on the 35 and 40 is going to depend a little bit on what kind of ridership we can really get. If I, had, if I had all my druthers, we'd have all parts of our region connected with that kind of service so that you and others could use it any time of the day or evening um, and, uh, and make it convenient. Lastly, let me restress that one of the things that I think is important is the technology that I think will be there, and that is handheld devices, I'm hoping for within one or two years, will be able to tell you when you, in fact, uh, can expect the next bus. Do you need to be able to, to leave uh, um, that cup of coffee uh, partly full and uh, get out to the bus stop, or are you able to wait a little bit longer? What have you, to be able to have that type of information and make your trip work better. Thank you. John, John Leeper, City Club member. A few years ago, Washington County floated the idea of using during light rails off hours the light rail trackage for the movement of cargo, and uh, that would be, I think, particularly appropriate now to the airport. Uh, I haven't heard you uh, speak of it here today. I haven't heard anything as to its status, and wondered if you could just uh, tell us whether it's a dead issue or it's under study or what. Um, the issue has been raised oftentimes about whether or not it might make sense. Let me tell you the two big obstacles that have to be overcome. Number one is that the time that, that uh, the movement of freight on the light rail alignment would make good sense is when you can use the right light rail alignment to get, for example, all the way to the air, uh, airport for, uh, uh, for shipment of goods during the time that the roads are blocked uh, with lots of traffic. But the problem, of course, is that that's the very time that we have most of the demand to be able to have passengers. So the first one is that, um, that, uh, that in the middle of the night, when the light rail isn't running uh, passengers, is a time when trucking um, doesn't have much trouble utilizing the roadways um, and, uh, and find that to be convenient. Number two is that uh, a light rail alignment isn't just something that uh, you're able to set that clock uh, to the perfect uh, place and then just let it run, it needs maintenance. And when we do most of our rail maintenance is in the middle of the night when we have our workers out there when in fact those light rail vehicles are not running where we can turn down the power, work on, uh, on the rail or the overhead electrical systems or other things. So the conflicts with uh, our maintenance are there. Now, are there ways to be able to potentially overcome those uh, two obstacles? Maybe. Maybe we'll have to see if there are still ways to work. Tom Bryan and I from Washington County have talked about this, but it still is not, uh, there just hasn't been enough uh, um, uh, 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 really a, an urging to be able to overcome um, and meet those off hour times. That's not the time those products need to move to market in a non congested roadway. We have time for two quick questions. Okay, uh, I have a, one quick question that needs a response before I ask the second one. And this is a real dumb question. How long is a TriMet train, a MAX train? Um, I want to say 200 and 180, 180. I would think it would have to be less than a city block. So, yeah. yeah. OK, I'm a bicyclist. <clears throat> and I am internally grateful to TriMet that I can put my bike on the MAX or a bus. I always put it on the MAX. The bus is still a learning curve for me, even though I watched the video about three times. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And I, you, know, you can go virtually anywhere in this metro area, and even, now, even more so now and with the North Portland, by putting your bike on the max, and then it's an easy bike ride almost anywhere, which means like the employment, with, if you can get almost any employer. The problem is the max is maxed out at rush hour, and it's hard to put the bike on the max. Uh, and it's most, I get reports from bicycles they can't put it on the max because they don't want to you know, get other people's stuff dirty and all that. So what accommodations are you, can you make, because it's right now it's like a very small percentage of bicyclists can do this at rush hour, and you know, you have 20 feet there. 20 feet on that thing that you could put a little car. Uh, <laughs> a little car in between the other two cars. 
I think they make them in Germany. So uh, what about that? If we look to be able to extend, extend the length of our vehicles, my guess is we'd probably put additional seats on those uh, vehicles. Um, because we are, we're seeing certainly a demand uh, for additional seats. However, we are doing things that are making the bicycle um, easier and, uh, and in fact taking up less space. We are installing on all our light rail vehicles hooks that allow for bicycles to be able to be hung. That means they take up less space, get less in the way of, uh, of other individuals, and really allow for easier movement around the doors. So we are taking other steps to be able to make that system work better, um, but do learn how to be able to make the bus system work. It's easy. Good afternoon, Fred. Scott Wise, City Club member. Uh, Tri TriMet's principal competition is still the automobile. The automobile industry provides and people pay thousands of dollars to obtain cars that have fulfill every creature comfort, satisfy every whim. In order to compete, public transportation needs to address the same issues. And there's two that I notice as a TriMet rider that are particularly ignored. And one of them, my first one, I'd like to know what you would do about each of these two and maybe suggest that you add them to your five-year plan. First is, why does TriMet buy buses that have seats that are too small? When you, when you get on a bus, there's somebody sitting next to the window and you sit down, if they happen to be not slim, uh, you're going to find yourself sitting halfway off the seat in an uncomfortable position for your entire ride. And the second issue is, if you stand on the bus mall or at a bus stop, reading your magazine, you'll have buses come by with an ear-piercing shriek of brakes that just drives you crazy. If you had a car like that, you'd get rid of it. Why, why can't buses solve this problem? I think that the um, issue of the size of seats uh, is a problem that uh, maybe I'll let the, uh, the federal uh, health institutes uh, address uh, in a broader way. We. Uh, we're addressing the issue um, certainly by trying to be able to make our seats more comfortable, to be able to have more lumbar support and other things. Uh, but again, there's only so much space we can have on a bus and we want to be able to try to, to make that work well. Um, specifically, uh, back to your, the second part of your question, um, which was, uh, just a second. Squeaky bus. Um, one of the things that the electric hybrid diesels do is that they, um, are able, one of the reasons why they're so efficient is that they have what is called regenerative braking. That is, as you take your foot off the gas, the, um, the, uh, what would be normally compression slowing you down is actually turning the electric motor and generating electricity, recharging the batteries. On the electric hybrid diesel buses, those vehicles are able to, in fact, um, uh, um, uh, recover about 40% of the um, energy that it takes to get up to speed, but in the process doesn't require braking, doesn't require that brake to be on that squeals um, and is one of the, the more annoying elements of those of us who also stand on the transit mall. One last thing, if I understand, uh, um, I just want to be able to mention that on each of your table, uh, at each of your table is a ticket uh, to be able to ride uh, Max uh, or the bus system. And if those of you who ride it all the time, um, you know how good the system is. Give it, if, uh, if you do ride it all the time, give it to a family member or a friend who uh, may not have experienced it. For those of you who haven't used it, uh, take a ride on TriMet. I think once you do, you'll enjoy it. How we get there does matter. Mr. Mr. President. Mr. President, may I, John Dellenbeck, non-City Club member, but City Club admirer. Uh, Fred, if, if any portion of our working together in the Congress and in Peace Corps has contributed to what you've done here as Assistant State Treasurer,